So hello and good afternoon. I welcome you to today's Trading Spotlight webinar here together with Atmara Markets. One second, please. Um, Okay, perfect. Yes. Uh, yes. So my name is Jens Klatt and I am the moderator here of the upcoming um, 40 to 45 minutes on a right now very interesting topic, in fact, and uh, that my surprise, um, the conclusion we come to when uh, looking at recent um, earnings, which were published by banks, US banks, JP Morgan, for example, Goldman Sachs, um, but also Wells Fargo, for example. And um, so we today want to have a look at the financial sector and uh, answer the question on how to trade the financial sector uh, via ETF CFDs, in fact. Um, and uh, before we start, let's first of all all have a look here at today's agenda and then take it from there. So first of all, we want to define uh, the financial sector. I mean, to some extent, it might be self-explaining and you wonder why it's necessary to, to define that. But I think to make this whole pack, a picture, um, um, uh, yeah, round or, or make, make it, make it um, um, uh, um, a good starting point, well, we have to define it. And then we uh, want to look at especially European banks, uh, which might be of special interest here. And uh, we want to have a look at the so-called price to book ratio we currently see in the European banking sector. And then we want to answer the question how to trade the European banking sector in general. But not only that, in fact, but um, we can also adopt the thoughts here from the European banking sector and what I will present to you in the upcoming minutes. Um, we can adopt this to the U.S. banking sector um, um, too. So there's um, also some some developments around uh, the uh, delinquencies, for example, and the uh, mortgage sector. There was um, uh, a push to the highest levels here since, and and even above that level of the great financial crisis in 2008. And um, the developments here are probably of higher interest for the months months to come. In fact. Um, in the U.S. in this case. So we can easily adopt what we will present on the European banking sector here to U.S. banks too. Before we start, um, let's first of all uh, probably introduce um, uh, myself, respectively, uh, the um, broker behind this trading spotlight webinar series. It's on our markets. So uh, when it comes to me, my name is uh, Jens Klatt. I'm uh, yeah, I'm I'm in the financial markets for nearly 20 years now. Um, I started working as an um, employee with the bank, and uh, then took it from there. St um, went to to university. Beside my studies of mathematics and and economics, I decided to uh, work as a trading assistant. Well, I worked as a trading assistant at a big stock broker here in um, in Berlin, in Germany. So I'm located in Berlin, in Germany. And uh, for further details beyond this, um, I think it probably makes sense to read the interview, which I did together with Admiral Markets around one year ago. Um, and uh, so that you have an idea of where I come from and um, um, where my experience especially um, comes from when it comes to trading the market. And uh, But I already emphasized Berlin, Germany here in this context. And there's where Admiral Markets comes into play. So Admiral Markets is um, probably one of the biggest um, and, and, and most and well-known uh, financial service providers in especially the CFD and the fixed industry and um, has offices around the globe in 20 and more countries. In fact, is uh, licensed not just by the FCA, but also in Europe, and there's the key word Brexit. So pre well prepared for the Brexit when it comes um, um, to, uh, to, to hard Brexit, let's call it, without um, a deal here. So it's also regulated by the CISIC. Um, it's also regulated in, in Australia, for example, um, with the ASIC. And uh, is um, in fact in the markets nearly for 20 years, so 19 years of, of, of reliability, in fact. So it's one uh, year ago that, that this, this slide was, was um, um, uh, formulated. And why is all this necessary? Why it's necessary to say that uh, it's not just a regulated broker, but having offices around the globe. It's very interesting when it comes to customer service. Um, so when you have a question around financial um, products, um, your account, your trading in general, um, I my, myself uh, like to talk to someone um, in, in, in my native language, which is German, for example. So it's not a, an issue to talk to someone in English, obviously, but still, I, I feel more comfortable with that. And uh, based on my experience in the broker industry in general, 
I can say that this is definitely um, uh, the case and, and something which is of high interest and very important for many, many customers. And without more markets, you, you not just have a broker who has lots of experience and very, very competitive um, trading conditions. This is not just true for the DAX, but also for our fixed markets. Um, here and, and there, have a look at the website at mymarkets.com. You will find um, not just um, a broad range of tradable assets, but you find also very, very, very competitive um, um, uh, conditions when it comes to commissions and, and all and spreads in this case. So in, in Germany, for example, we refer to Admiral as the DAX 30 expert, in fact, um, but also when it comes to FX trading, it's a very competitive offering. So definitely worth a look. Um, that's all I can I can say here, and uh, I'm I'm uh, yeah very happy to be here within this this series trading spotlight. So now let's have a look at uh, the financial sector and start with today's webinar topic and have a look here on um, on on uh, yeah what the financial sector is in fact. So the segment financial sector goes in fact way beyond the banking sector even though um, it must should be clear that the banking sector plays a very very important role in this context um, so when you're looking at etfs so so-called exchange traded funds you probably um, have listened to a webinar before um, where we introduced exchange traded funds um, in the us the so-called xlf where the f stands for financial aims to track the us financial sector with allocating funds in the not just banking industry as i already said but also insurance real estate investment trusts so so-called reits um capital markets and uh, diversified financial services consumer finance real estate management and development and thrifts and mortgage finance industry finance industry so it, especially the latter one uh, mortgage finance industries and also here banking play both play a very very important role when it comes to the upcoming uh, minutes here in regards to the uh to the um uh, to, to, to today's topic, how to trade the financial sector and why probably from a risk reward perspective, short engagements should be favored. Um, there is an, well, let's call it equivalent. Probably it's a fair way to put it, even though from a uh, trading volume perspective, um, XLF is way more actively traded, in fact. But uh, um, a pendant European um, 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 ETF, which also tracks the uh, banking sector, is the so-called Lixor Stocks European 600 Banks Usage ETF, um, short it's uh, BNK. Um, and uh, it tracks the biggest European stock exchanges for banks in Europe, in fact. Um, and in fact, when, when looking and comparing uh, these two funds with each other, you will see that there is um, a lack. Uh, in, in case of, of performance from a performance perspective. So it's not only that um, uh, bank banks in general, the banking sector, financial industry also failed to uh, take on bullish momentum after the Corona lockdown and the turbulence we've seen in markets and this market turmoil and, and, and equities being under pressure. And then now seeing this sharp reversal, which was mainly driven by the tech sector, but um, uh, the banking sector and the financial industry um, in general, lacks this this bullish momentum, and one reason will be presented here. It's probably the core reason why this is the case. But before we now have a look at um, ETF, um, uh, the ETF XLF here, and uh, the top ten holdings, um, and how and how um, uh, this looks like, we probably want to first of all have a look here at the website from Admiral Markets. I have already opened it. And um, I will guide you through um, the way how you get there, where you find all the information on ETFs here and also ETF, CFDs on ETFs in this case uh, for further information then. And, and also how to find, in this case, BNK. So it's not very, it, well, not very easy. So it, um, this is, this is um, uh, um, uh, yeah, probably, um, how can I say that? It's a disadvantage if you have so many products offered um, that you that you're not right um, um, see right from the start um, uh, the possibilities which are open there. So I mean, most active traded, uh, most actively traded assets like the DAX or like EURUSD, dollar JPY, um, you can easily find it by going to AppMarketers.com. You go to start trading, or respectively here products in this case, and then you have EURUSD, gold, DAX, and all this. But um, when it comes to more to some extent exotic, but still very important from an um, um, economic perspective, um, 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 markets and also ETFs like 
the um, XLF, but also the BNK when it comes to European, the European banking sector, then it's not that obvious where to find this. And so this is what I want to guide you through. So you go to products and then you click here on ETFs. And let's probably do this. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm already one step after that. So you can see here the contract spe specifications. Um, and this is the, the website you get here, and there you can already see it. It's XLF right at the top. This is some how you how you can trade the um, U.S. financial sector. Since we want to have a look here at the BNK, the European banking sector, we have to dig a little deeper. Uh, just to 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 um, um, follow up here on on what this is. QQQ is, for example, the uh, Nasdaq 100 ETF. It's an equivalent here. Um, SPY is the spider, it's the S&P 500, and the GDX is, for example, for the um, uh, gold mining sector, respectively an ETF, which tracks gold mining stocks especially. But not just that, but also precious metals, which comes into, um, um, uh, which, which comes, runs into the focus here. And um, so what we wanna do is now, we want to, to uh, look here at all ETF CFDs, click on this, tap then and uh, there you have an overview not just in fact on the um, ETFs itself but here on all products and, and and which are offered already here now it's open the ETF um, but if if you come to this side and it's not directly opened here you click on ETFs in this case and then this opens here and it's sorted by exchange and country and uh, since we are we are looking at um, um, the banking sector, we can also sort it here by category in this case. And then we have to, to scroll a little and you will find out you have here the financial equity um, section. And then you click on, on, an, the, on this link and now you could here scroll through this or just you enter a symbol and this is BNK. And there we go. There's the Lick Source Stocks European 600 banks usage. ETF CFD in this case. Um, so this is what we want to look at when it comes to European financials. We can also type in XLF here and there you have um, the details for the financial sector um, spider fund ETF CFD. And here now we want to have a look at um, the top holdings, but in addition to that also at the European banking uh, sector then and which um, 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 top holdings it has um, in its, in its uh, BNK ETF in this case. So let's go back here to the presentation and now let's have a look at uh, the ETF XLF and their top 10 holdings. And uh, I have um, already prepared it here. Um, um, so I, I, I did a snapshot um, on an, I think it was an external website. I think it was Yahoo Finance, but there's also an ETF dot com I'm not, I'm not sure i'm not very sure anymore but you can easily google that to get the top 10 holdings here for um um yeah for for an illustration of which which um um titles it includes and what you can see here is uh the who is who of the financial sector let's say um so you have berkshire hathaway here for example um, with um, a 13.7%, but you also have JP Morgan. We also mentioned it, but we have also Wells Fargo, for example, Bank of America, Citigroup. Um, there's also BlackRock. I think they published numbers today, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Goldman Sachs was today, yesterday, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, as you can see here, so it's, as I already said, let's see who is who. You have um, um, the big financial um, um, uh, giants in it, um, investment banks, respectively banks, which um, everyone has heard about. If, if he's um, um, interested in, in, in finance, or even if, if he's not, most likely you probably have an account with them in one or the other way. And um, why is it noteworthy that, that we point out JP Morgan here or Wells Fargo? So first of all, let's have a look at, at Wells Fargo, respectively talk a little about Wells Fargo. It's not that we want to have a look um, at Wells Fargo, but um, it's uh, the case that Wells Fargo um, just um, released their earnings for Q2 2020. And uh, they posted the first quarterly loss since 2008. Um, and why is this uh, noteworthy? Because it points to some trouble ahead. Um, it's not quite obvious, but probably uh, it's just something to, to keep in mind, um, uh, especially as a player in the, um, it's called in the retail business or in the loan industry, playing a very important role, obviously, because um, um, if, you, if, if you don't play such an important role in the financial sector in this, uh, in this regard, you wouldn't be listed here in the top 10 holdings of XLF. Let's 
quite self-explaining, I think. Um, but probably even more um, astounding is the numbers from JP Morgan. You probably heard that um, JP Morgan, when looking at the numbers themselves, you found out you will find out quite quickly that they did well. So um, in fact, when looking at um, at the number uh, at the numbers for the corporate and investment banking division, they um, um, released a record 5.5 billion USD profit for uh, the second quarter, which means nothing more if you translate this than that they are making more money in the corporate and investment banking world um, uh, in this division alone than most entire banks typically typically generate here um, um, and and not just not just typically generate per year but also generated per year um, uh, before the coronavirus pandemic so we're talking about numbers they published now during respectively after this um, pandemic and after the lockdown in March, and they publish a record 5.5 billion um, profit here. So, uh, but this is just one side of the of the coin in this case. So we look at the other side. It's not just corporate and investment banking and this division, which plays a role when looking at JP Morgan, but it's also um, there's also the consumer and the commercial bank division. And uh, here they um, set aside 8.9 billion USD for expected loan defaults um, across its um, operations due to the coronavirus pandemic. And uh, these defaults, um, um, this is something which, is, which, is, uh, which could mean lots of trouble ahead. Um, especially um, right now, these, these um, uh, losses or potential losses they see here due to loan defaults, they can be offset by, by gains you make in the trading industry. But when, when looking carefully and read between the lines, you will find out that trading and volatility or revenue you, you generate when it comes to trading. Um, and here, volatility and interest rates, respectively yields, they are um, strongly positively correlated to each other, which means Means if volatility is high, as we have seen, um, then usually you should expect your trading business do well, especially if you're, um, yeah, if you if you're in the in the middle, um, and 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 you make money um, both um, on both sides of the coin due to elevated trading activity. In fact, so as a broker, if you want, um, this is when you what, what you profit from. The only problem is that you should expect volatility to especially if, if the corona lockdown um, 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 is, is um, overcome and the fat probably um, just liquidates away any, any, any problems when it comes to liquidity issues, let's say. Um, also here, there's, there's some, how can I say that? There's some uh, doubts uh, when it comes to the connection between JP Morgan and, and the Fed, for example. So JP Morgan is a very big player um, and, and, and um, um, is a strong uh, in, in strong demand of liquidity when it comes to the repo market, which was in fact saved. It, it nearly froze last year already in, in, in September with uh, um, um, yields here shooting through the roof. And uh, JP Morgan, um, yeah, they, they, they survived to some extent. We can't really say that. It, it didn't make, make such big headlines, but um, we can really say JP Morgan survived due to the Fed because they delivered the liquidity, which was so much needed um, in the repo market to keep the machine going here in this case. Um, so, but the thing is that um, once volatility starts to drop again, which we should expect, it won't happen overnight. It won't happen um, over the next um, um, weeks, months. So I, I really expect volatility to stay elevated and high, but with um, the overall expectation of yields dropping to zero, also in the US, not just in the in Europe. So, and therefore look at the Euro um, yourself. Um, when looking at FX markets, for example, you see volatility to be really, really subdued. And this is due to the fact that there is no, no, no real yield differential anymore. So there's no um, attractive carry trade anymore, which means that volatility usually dries out and drops further with and hand in hand with um, um, yields dropping in this case to zero, which means nothing more than these um, possibility of offsetting losses from uh, one or two other divisions um, will probably become uh, not possible in the future anymore with um, the outlook of dropping yields in this case. So yields, or I put it very, very simply, we can say yields are 
um, the volatility and the air you need to breathe to survive. Yields are um, the core business of banks in general. They make money out of yields. They make money with money thanks to yields and, 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 and this, this, this concept behind this. Um, and uh, so that said, we should um, expect, in fact, so here the they trading or uh, investment banking and corporate division not to offset these potential losses anymore. And in addition to that, there's also something else. I unfortunately haven't prepared a chart to this, but um, you can I look this up. Let me just see. Probably. Let me just let me just give it a try. Let me just see whether um, whether I can find something. Um, and I hope it, it it's uh, mortgage delink. Couldn't see rates. Hopefully this is now fast enough. Because what we can see here is that these numbers um, shot through the roof. And the numbers were published by, I think, the Washington Post over this week. Um, and uh, um, I'm not sure. I think this one is for probably good to go. Yeah, I think it worked. Yeah, but yeah, why not? I mean, yeah, yeah, why not? So this is this is the the, the chart, and uh, unfortunately, it does not go back to two thousand and eight. But uh, you can you can believe me that if you go back here, you usually have same tendency, and there was a, a short spike on the upside in two thousand eight during the great financial crisis. Um, and why is this of interest? Well, it means nothing more. Um, so by the way, the numbers, I, I haven't prepared. I should have prepared it because it's um, based on, on numbers from CoreLogic, this, the company behind us. And uh, what means nothing more um, that, that here there's trouble ahead because um, these, these mortgage delinquencies um, rising to an all-time high and passing levels in 2008 means uh, nothing more. And by the way, they, they do not include mortgages that are in forbearance, which leads us to come to the conclusion when looking carefully at these numbers that non-performing loans should be expected to rise significantly. And we're not really sure whether these um, 8.9 billion JP Morgan announced to set aside here for loan defaults will be enough, in fact. So I, to be honest, I think they won't be enough, which means going hand in hand with um, potentially dropping um, revenues in the um, um, investment banking and the corporate banking um, sector, has probably um, some serious trouble ahead for, for JP Morgan here in this, in this context. Um, so why do I say all this? Well, I, I, I put all this or I say all this because it's um, um, a crucial to understand where my bearish outlook for the banking sector in general, not just in Europe, but also in the US comes from, and to understand the idea behind the trading idea we want to formulate or why we want to trade favor the short side here. So, um, now, having said all this in regards to JP Morgan and in regards to Wells Fargo, having said all this in regards to the U.S. banking sector in general and XLF, now let's have a look here at BNK um, and the European 600 bank, Bank's UCITS ETF in this case. So the, um, uh, yeah, the, the ETF, which, which um, um, shows how is the um, uh, development going in the banking world in Europe in this case. So you can see that... Um, this is a German chart, by the way. So it's um, from, from Finanzen. It's a quite big um, 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 German uh, website, in fact. Um, and uh, so here, 41.6% around is um, everyone else, let's say. But you can see that more than 50% of this, of this um, BNK ETF here is covered from the banks being um, mentioned here. So which is HSBC with 15.16%. This is this piece here. Um, then you have BNB Paribas. This is the big um, uh, French bank. You have Banco Santander. This is um, a Spanish bank. Below that, there's UBS, the big Swiss bank. You have here Intesa San Paolo. Okay, let me just think. I think this could be Italian, I think. Um, then we have Lloyd's here. And this is this one. Then we have ING. This is ING is a, is a bank from the Netherlands, Barclays. Um, then we have Nordea. This is um, a Scandinavian bank. Credit Suisse is also a Swiss bank and then everyone else. So as you can see here, this is the who is who of the um, uh, 
of the of the European banking sector. Some might, of you might probably be a surprise because we have Deutsche Bank, for example, the, the big German um, um, player in the market. Well, it has to do with uh, current developments in the um, share and also a diminishing and and, and horrible outlook from a um, um, business perspective due to the um, zero um, and, and negative yield policy from the ECB, which is the core of, of the business model of a bank also here in Europe. So it's around the globe, the same, uh, same story when it comes to yields, that this is crucial to run a profitable business when it comes to, to banks. And uh, Deutsche just lost so much in, in market capitalization that it's not even listed here um, um, anymore. But this is not the point. So. Um, you have with BNK, so you have an um, 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 ETF which covers the whole financial slash banking sector here in Europe then in this context. And uh, now what we want to have a look at here is um, we want to look at the so-called bank um, um, European banks price to book value. So um, just to, to give you an explanation of what this is, the price to book ratio is a financial ratio which is used to compare a company's current market price to its book value. And what you can see when looking here at the, um, at the, at the uh, current um, uh, developments is that the price to book value is um, above the Europe, I'm sorry, the Stocks Europe Index price to book value is above the Stocks Europe 600 banks price to book value, which means that um, that here there is some. Uh, yeah, how can I put this in a very simple way? Um, let's 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 look at this that way. So what we can see here is that that banks are. Um, low performing underperforming when it come in comparison to the overall um, market and right now already and this for quite a while now so um, um, this has been the case especially when it came here to the great financial crisis but it hasn't changed since then um, and there, there was no no real no real um, positive development over the last 10 years and this was mainly due to the massive um, 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 the massive monetary injections and the massive liquidity being delivered, especially here in Europe from the ECB, um, um, and which was injected into banks here to keep the business alive, even though with the fact that yields dropped to nearly zero, and not just that, not just to nearly zero, but to zero and even below that into negative territory, pointing uh, to some serious trouble ahead when it comes to the overall um, business model when we look at banks. So, here in Europe in general, to make long things short, um, the situation has been very tense already um, and becomes probably even more tense now because over time uh, there were developments which made it already very, very difficult. Um, zero yield, negative yield environment for European banks to uh, keep their business alive, to make money in general. Um, and uh, so the situation now becomes even more tense because there has been a time when you could simply argue with what, you, what some people said. Well, they said, just imagine uh, yields to rise. There was some, some problems ahead, let's put it that way, because you deliver all this cheap liquidity from a, from a central bank, you deliver this to the market, and you use a bank to deliver it then to customers. And then um, they, they, they say, okay, they're that massively leveraged and there's so much debt right now uh, being accumulated over the last decade, in fact, that once yields rise, you have banks in the comfortable situation in this case that they can start to make business and money again with rising yields. And because yields are directly connected to some extent to, uh, um, 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 to, the, to the profits, to the earnings of, of a bank in general. But the problem is that once yields rise, then the uh, debtors, they can't pay back their debt because uh, it becomes too expensive for them. And their business model is probably not as, um, uh, not as solid as it should be. So, um, which let many come to the conclusion the, uh, in this case, the, the ECB can't keep this, this, uh, this, this massive liquidity injections. They can't keep this forever, which means nothing more. Rather sooner than later, they probably stop this or the, the economy um, 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 has to, gains momentum and then they, they have to start hiking rates again. Um, and, and, and 
take away the, the so badly needed liquidity, especially from, from the market, which will result in yields to start to rise, which will then result in many, many defaults, which will then negatively affect banks, and in this case, the whole banking sector. So that was, that was the, the, um, um, uh, the, the path you followed once you argued why rising yields are um, yeah, toxic for um, uh, the whole concept or the, the, the whole picture we started to paint over the last 10 years. Right now, with the corona lockdown, now the thing is that um, you don't need yields to rise because now um, there is lots of defaults, in fact, developing here um, in the, on the whole um, European um, um, economy already due to the corona lockdown. Just imagine, I mean, it's a very simple um, example, but just imagine you're highly leveraged and you invested tons of cheap liquidity and money uh, and made um, um, lots of debt um, and, and loaded on lots of debt here to run your restaurant or your, your small cafe or whatever. Um, so now there's a Corona lockdown and no one comes to your, to come to your restaurant anymore, right? So you won't make any money and there's no cash flow and you can't pay back all the debt, which means you, you go bankrupt, which is very, very unfortunate. But now the question is, who pays back the loan to the bank. Um, and this is exactly the thing, because now the bank has the problem. They have lots of, of, of um, 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 loans, outstanding loans, which are um, turning sour, let's say. And uh, this is now where the problem comes into play and when the question arises, obviously you can already see um, where all this leads to. So, and why, why we want to short the, the, the banking sector here, in fact. Um, Banks, let's put this together now. Uh, banks seem to be in better shape than they were during the great financial crisis. When you look at, for example, um, uh, all the regulation having taken place and, and not being that exposed to uh, risk in your PL and your trading anymore and all this, um, the corona lockdown now um, will definitely result in massive loan losses. And we can already see this. No one is talking about this, but I think um, there, there will be a domino effect. And rather sooner or later, you will not, um, 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 you, you can't hide this anymore. What am I talking about? Well, there was some, it's probably three weeks ago or something. Um, there was an announcement from the European Banking Authority, which no one really talked about, but uh, which shows that this is not just a scenario you, you paint here on the wall and, and now, I'm uh, kind of a um, writer of the apocalypse or something like that, but it's real. This is, this is real um, and it's happening already. Um, and I want to show you why I know this and where I know this from. So this here is a press release from the 18th of June. It's one month ago, 2020 here. And the headline reads, EBA, it's the European Banking Authority, extends the deadline for the application of its guidelines on payment moratory to 30th of September. Great, right? So no one really knows what is this about. Now you, you look at this here and say, okay, do I really need to read this? Is this really that important? So I think it is. Um, and, and you should definitely um, take five minutes and read it, in fact. So I will share, by the way, the, the link here in the, uh, in the chat box. Um, let me just see, where is it? Where is the chat box? There we go. So um, I, I just I just call it EBA. Sorry, EBA. And it reads: the European Banking Authority has decided today to extend the application date of its guidelines on legislative and non-legislative moratoria to 30th of September. With EU economies not yet fully opened, this extension shows the importance of a continued support to the measures taken by banks to extend loans. And this is exactly where it comes what it comes down to, to extend loans in response to the extraordinary nature of the current situation. This extension would ensure that adequate treatment of borrowers for borrowers is available across the EU, considering that the COVID-19 crisis has been affecting EU countries in a different way and, a different play, and at a different pace. So still, we don't really know what this means. I can translate this very easily because Baffin here in Germany, um, they, they take this decision from EBA. So this is German now. They take this decision from EBA and just forward it to their banks. Um, what, what does it say? What does this, this decision mean? 
this extension, what does it mean? It means that uh, banks who know that people who borrowed money from them and will default on their loans, that banks can still say, well, guys, our um, thanks to this decision, they can say um, it's still of value. This, this, this loan, even though we know that the borrower will default on it, and it's, 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 there's no value to connect it to it anymore because the borrower can't pay back this loan anymore. But they, they are allowed to say, well, it still it has a value, and that's why we are not yet insolvent because we are talking about of billions of, of, of euros in this case, which um, borrowers will default on due to the corona lockdown. And now the EBA says, um, well, it might be that you're um, insolvent, the banks that you're insolvent, but you're allowed to, um, um, to, 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 yeah, to, to hide your insolvency, in fact, not talk about it. You don't need to put it in your balance, but you can, you can um, um, run your business as usual. And we just, we just say, well, nothing happened so far. So this is, this is what happens here. You can hide your insolvency. You're allowed to do that. Well, if I do this as a, as a, um, a one-man company, for example, if I do that um, on, a, on a big scale, let's say, I'd go to jail, okay? Um, if I do it on a smaller scale, I at least will never be allowed to open a business anymore and pay um, a heavy, heavy um, um, a fee for, for doing that. Or um, um, I, I have to pay lots of money for, for, for having done that. Again, on a big scale, if I do it like a bank as a one-man company, I'd go to jail. Everyone would go to jail, at least here in Germany. Um, here, the EBA decides, and Baffin echoes that, they decide, it's fine. You, we know you're insolvent. You know you're insolvent. Uh, but you know, need to say you're insolvent. Just run your business as usual because we go back to normal um, uh, quite soon and everything's fine. So make long things short. What's uh, written down here is... Uh, exactly what I'm, what I'm looking at when, when I talk about massive loan losses. They already can see the massive loan losses in their books. It's the only thing they don't need to um, um, say they, they are real. It's like, like having a floating loss in your trading account, for example. Um, and, and, and you're, you're yeah, it's, it's like, like, like the broker now um, um, comes to you and says, well, just to let you know, your margin, you're running out of margin deposit more or let's say, well, you don't need to deposit more because you're affected by Corona lockdown. We just extend um, uh, um, at the position size here or at, and not the position size, your, your account balance. And we just, we just, um, uh, you won't, you won't get real margin call, let's say on your position. And this is exactly what's happening here. So we know that there is already massive losses and, and losses which already affect banks in a way that they be insolvent under normal market conditions, but they're allowed to hide these losses, in fact, and, and, and these, these, uh, yeah, these defaults in this case. In addition to that, low and zero and negative rate interest rates and policy from the ECB will likely continue, not just in here in Europe, but this will also affect the US, which is one of the reasons why I'm very, very um, um, positive for precious metals in this case. So we're not only talking about gold, but probably silver has some outperformance potential here. For further details, by the way, I check out the uh, traders block section on abnormalmarkets.com. There's an idea on, on precious metals in this case. Um, and this will, as we already pointed out here, not just in case of JP Morgan, but also in case of European banks, it will result in further shrinking revenue and income streams. And um, Rising competition from financial technology companies like online on, online only challenge banks and peer to peer um, application providers are also weighing on the sector. So uh, to make long stay short, um, it's not just in in the U.S. but also uh, probably especially in Europe that uh, the banking sector will take a serious hit ahead. It depends a little on when it's at the time uh, that they can't hide these developments anymore, but it's likely that it will happen rather sooner than later because you can already see the cracks in the bottle, let's say. Um, it's only a question of time once this, this um, pressure um, overwhelms the, 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 the whole sector and, and just we'll get to see a collapse. And uh, that said, obviously, you can now come to the conclusion that the BNK, BNK um, ETF CFD, so covering the, the um, European uh, um, banking sector here seems an interesting midterm 
I think it's midterm. It's not even long term. And I think it's a midterm um, short trade um, idea here from a risk reward perspective. I won't go into details now and, and formulate a clear setup. I think I, I um, probably did enough damage by, by formulating what I just formulated. But um, I think now it's the weekend and, and you can think about this a, a little. And, and probably I echo already your skepticism, which built over time. And now you say, well, this is this is really something um, which, which looks not very, very promising. And um, given the fact that, that you can trade whole sectors via ETFs and CFDs in this case from the short side. So we're not talking about the offering. That's also possible. You can invest um, um, with, meta um, um, uh, with Atma Markets via the MetaTrader into ETFs. But this is only possible from the long side. So we're clearly looking here at ETFs and here at ETF CFDs so that you're capable of shorting whole sectors. In fact, in this case, the European banking sector. It's not possible to do this um, unleveraged, let's say, via the classic ETF, which is really the exchange traded fund in this case. But here we have to really take a closer look at the ETF CFD in this case to short um, the whole sector. It's not just true for the European banking sector, but also for XLF in this case, so the US financial sector. So to sum all this up, the segment financial sector goes way beyond the bank sector. That became clear already. And then we, we had not just um, banks, but also, as you have seen, for example, the mortgage sector, which um, came into play. And um, as I already um, I'm shown to you here, hopefully um, in an understandable way and not too complicated, um, in the current environment, given all the developments around the corona lockdown, the European banking sector might still uh, be of higher interest than the financial sector as a whole. Um, probably, yeah, I mean, there, there will be, there will be um, um, some serious developments here in the whole financial sector in general. That's also true then for XLF in the US and especially, but the European banking sector is probably of, of special interest in this case. And uh, the lagging recovery here of European banks after the first Corona sell-off, which we've already seen, um, is already, I think, it might be, but in, in my opinion, it is really um, a sign that an attractive BNK ETF CFD short might be around the corner. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry. And uh, yeah, to, if you plan to trade this, check out atmarmarkets.com. Go to the um, ETF um, CFD section here for further details. You can see plenty of opportunities here. So probably you might say BNK is already attractive, but what about this and that? Therefore, by the way, feel free to um, share your thoughts, your ideas, here um, also in our trading um, um, spotlight community. Um, and uh, so far, that's it around uh, the, the ETF banking sector. A short idea from my end and why I'm very skeptical of, about this, this whole sector. Um, don't forget to join us next time. Next webinar here in Trading Spotlight webinar will be on Monday um, with Paul together on uh, Bollinger Bands and uh, trading strategies around Bollinger Bands. It's volatility based, obviously. And uh, he will introduce you to the concept of, of Bollinger Bands, what they are and how you can use them in your trading. Um, and also on many different ways, you can use them in your trading in general and uh, take a different look here at Bollinger Band strategies in different markets. Same time, Monday, 2 p.m. London, 20th of July. Um, it will be for all those participating right here in the webinar, live now, asking the questions. Um, you, can, you can just wait for the link to be uh, forwarded to your, to your inbox. It's an uh, um, ongoing webinar, in fact. For all those watching this now on YouTube, um, if you like what you just um, uh, um, um, seen and, and the presentation, then please feel free to... Uh, give a like on, on, the, on the YouTube recording. Um, also, ask, feel free to ask your questions in the chat box right below the video. Um, if you want to join the webinar live and ask a question here in real time, please feel free to head over to uh, atmarmarkets.com there to the education and the webinars tab and there register under Trading Spotlight. It's completely free, um, taking place three times a week with Paul on Mondays and with Marcus on Wednesdays and uh, me on, on our Fridays. And uh, further infos can be found here at normalmarkets.com. Here is uh, all the potential contact details. And uh, here's the, regula uh, the, the risk disclaimer. I emphasized it at the beginning with the regulation. And that's why it's very, very important. All the best. Happy trading. Have a nice weekend. Enjoy yourself. Talk to you again next week on Friday. I look forward to it. See you. And bye-bye.